So as you heard, my name is Mark Greenberg, and I've had the privilege of the power to save children's lives. But in doing so, I may have significantly compromised the quality of life of their family and of the child. Life preserved, quality perhaps not. I am a pediatric oncologist and have spent most of my professional career at Sick Kids in Toronto. And I have all the titles and plaudits that go with that. Professor of this and that, director of this and that. And, and one of which I'm particularly proud, a founder and subsequently medical director of POGO, the Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario, an organization founded to ensure equitable access for all children to compassionate and comprehensive care. In my professional context, I have made life and death decisions every day. And I have learned that there's more to medicine than curing. After 45 years or thereabouts in practice, I know about healing and I understand the difference between the two. A paradigm that's applicable way beyond childhood cancer. Because childhood cancer is not a disease of cells and genes and proteins and arms and legs and blood and bone and brains. It is all of those, but it is also a disease of mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and grandparents and the extended society in which they live. And I know also that when cancer intrudes on your home, its impact never goes away. The child may be cured, but what it has done to the child the family and the context in which they live is long-lasting. Life-threatening illness changes everything for everyone. The commonly held construct of ideal health care is a rapid, responsive, effective, convenient and inexpensive exchange of goods for services with attached metrics. Numbers of visits, numbers of procedures, wait times, sort of like a supermarket checklist. And that may be appropriate for preventative strategies and for the treatment of transient intercurrent illness like infections or, or uh, pneumonia, or for confined surgical interventions like fixing a hernia or, or taking out a gallbladder. But I believe that <clears throat> medicine must be founded in and essentially contain the construct of trafficking in mercy. Because health is a good not like any other good. It is a transaction beyond the exchange of dollars for services. And I'd like to tell you why I believe that. But before I continue talking as a professional and an expert who, who has held this awesome power of life and death decisions, a disclosure. I am also a father of a child who was lost to cancer. A decision maker and a healer, not able to make decisions, nor heal, nor even cure. And in those blinding moments, I understood that whatever idea one has, that one has control over one's children's lives, or one's own lives, or their collective futures, is transient at best and absent at worst. And in those moments, I understood the difference between healing and cure. Because cure is the construct that whatever brought the patient into the ambit of the healthcare system is done with, abolished, fixed. There may be some pain and some rehabilitation, but we are better at the end than we were at the beginning, and there is an end and a beginning. And the information we need to process to understand <clears throat> what is going to happen is reasonable and the decision making pretty straightforward and certainly within the ken of the average person in the street. We even quite often get to decide when the fix will happen. We have a sense of control and we are used to it. We expect it and even demand it. And the problem is that that translates into other aspects of health care and life-threatening illness does not fit the model because of the enormity of the decision-making, because of the magnitude of the consequences, and because it will change life forever. It needs healing beyond cure. Because healing 
is the construct that illness is not a biological disease. It is a biological disease, but it is also a psychological, behavioral, emotional, and social and societal disease. And the corollary is that healing must encompass the notion of adapting to whatever the physical state of health of the patient is or was, and the illness experience of all of the participants in this complex dance of illness, whatever the outcome. And the outcome may be survival, not scarred, or survival scarred to a greater or lesser extent, or indeed in my circumstances, even death. And the new life that will emerge as the consequence of this illness cannot escape the circumstances that created it. The impact will reverberate down time and over generations. And that may be growthful, that, that may produce enlargement. Let me tell you, for example, the story of a little girl called Beth, who was sent to me when she was nine months old with a kidney tumor, which was imminently curable with simple therapy. And that's what we did with Beth. We gave her simple chemotherapy, we took out our kidney, and we watched her grow from a toddler to a charming, delightful, engaging child until 18 months after her diagnosis when her tumor came back in her liver. And that changed the whole circumstance because survival for that condition is 20% and it mandates aggressive therapy. That's what we did. We gave her aggressive chemotherapy, we did radical resection and we radiated her. And we watched her grow and thrive. I watched her through her childhood, more and more engaging as time went on. A charming teenager, an extroverted, exciting person. Until 15 years after her diagnosis, when she crashed into heart failure as a result of our treatment and required a heart transplant. A dramatic example of the impact never going away. But you should see her today. A 20-something-year-old university graduate, a jazz dancer, an exciting, vivacious, and engaging spokesperson for the charities she believes in and is committed to, supported by a strong and cohesive family, a healed family. But it doesn't always work out that way. And by contrast, let me tell you about Dylan, who was a little boy sent to me when he was 16 months old with a brain tumor that had spread up and down his spinal cord. And the treatment for that was radiation to the head and spine. And that produced a 45% cure rate. But we knew from treating other children of this age that radiating these kids produces catastrophic outcomes. They are profoundly brain damaged, they are short, they are deaf, and they are totally socially inept. And so when I sat down with the parents to do the disclosure interview, and the parents were mid-twenties, street smart folk, I described what was going to happen, <coughs> and because I believe a professional needs to make a recommendation, I made my recommendation, which was that we should not treat Dylan. And mother looked at me and said, you've got to be crazy. I have a living, breathing, responding child here, and you say, don't treat him, you treat him. And so we did. And I followed him for about three years, and then he disappeared. And he walked into my clinic at age 17. This high, profoundly cognitively damaged, unable to negotiate his way down the corridor. And he was there because as a result of the damage to his frontal lobes, he had a surge of hormones, and every little girl that walked past him, he grabbed, and he'd been charged with sexual assault. And what they wanted from me was a letter indicating that they were mitigating circumstances. And I gave it to them. And as they walked out of my clinic, the mother looked at me with a glitter of anger in her eyes and said, knowing what you knew, how could you have let me treat him? And what's the answer to the question? How could I have? Should I have refused to treat him? And how would this decision-making process have played out in your family context? What would the change in the interaction, the dynamics of the family have done to the archetypal roles of mothering and fathering? Could you have processed that kind of information and understood this complexity and the implications in the long term? I can only tell you that when it was my turn, I could not. And I fervently hope that you never have to face those kinds of circumstances. So, cure or healing, what do we want out of our system? Do we have control? 
because major illness is the ultimate threat and the ultimate loss of control in a society obsessed with and totally committed to control, control of every aspect of our lives, our schedules, our diet, our children's schedules. And our society has a mythology that if you work hard, do the right thing, the world will unfold as it should because you are directing it. Well, guess what? Major illness does not fit that model. <coughs> because of <coughs> the enormity of the consequences and because of its impact, it does not fit this model. And this loss of control is tolerated far less well by contemporary generations than by prior generations. This intolerance of loss of control has resulted in a major paradigm shift in the doctor-patient relationship and as a result health care and complicated by a medical system that has not always behaved in a stellar fashion this control conflict has redefined the relationships within healing and within health care as exemplified by the renaming of patient as client or customer two categories of consumer that have choice in their purchase. Something very difficult to achieve when the purchase is your child's life and future. So what control do we have? As the parent of a child, you have complete control. Or do you? Let me tell you about baby <coughs> Brandon, who was sent to me at age 14 months with a diagnosis of myeloblastic leukemia, a disease with a 35% cure rate, with treatment that would produce short-term illness but long-term health if it worked. And so I sat down to do the disclosure interview with mum, and it turned out that mum was a 45-year-old woman and <coughs> Brendan was her first and only child. And when I laid out the plan, she said, I don't want your treatment, I don't need your poisons, and I won't have them. Turns out she had a belief in the natural order of things. She believed that the world would unfold naturally and whatever perturbation there was in the natural unfolding would correct itself without my help. Thank you very much. I did what I needed to do. I went to <coughs> children's aid, which went to court, which gave the children's aid the right to make the medical decisions while mum retained custodial care. And we treated <coughs> Brendan. And he was sick for a couple of months and since then has thrived. And if you see him now, he's a great, huge, 16-year-old, hairy son of a gun, <laughs> cured, and his mother is totally alienated from society. She believes her rights were violated. She believes her son's rights were violated. She believes the natural order of thing was, things was violated. A cured child. No healing there. And by contrast, <coughs> let me tell you about Brian, who was a little guy sent to me, roughly the same age as Brendan, with a different kind of leukemia, one that had a survival probability of 70% without treatment. Brian was the product of a couple who belonged to a church who believes absolutely that blood transfusion is proscribed by biblical edict. And so when they arrived at the hospital, they arrived with their church support group and their church lawyers with loins girded for court battle. And when I sat down to do the disclosure interview, I outlined for them the treatment. And then I said, I understand and respect your religion. And I will honor it until and unless I believe Brian's life is at risk. And in, if and when that happens, I will act unilaterally under the common law and I will transfuse him. And you felt the tension drain out of the room. And I watched Brian carefully for 48 hours and I really searched my conscience and then decided that his life was at risk, and I transfused him. And the parents were grateful, and they acknowledged this <coughs> as a good faith decision. Some of my colleagues felt it was a little controversial, but the net upshot was a healed family who is still in touch with me 12 years, 12 years later, and I'm pleased to tell you Brian is doing very well. So what does society want? We want a healthcare system that works for us. We lay out guidelines and, and indicators and wait times, and we have access to a huge range of elective, elective surgical procedures for non-life-threatening illnesses. We may have to wait a little, but we have that access. There are people out there 
who believe that medicine should be turned into a business, that patients should become clients. I support the notion of individual-centric patient care, but I think we need to look very carefully before we shift the paradigm of our healthcare system, a system designed to give us what we need when we need it and being reinterpreted to be what we want when we want it. That has huge implications for care, cure, and healing. What I do is difficult, but incredibly rewarding. Nobody goes into pediatric oncology to increase their income. You do it because you have a passion for caring for children, for healing, and for healing families. We are not health care providers. We are healers. We traffic in mercy every day, whether that trafficking is chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, or finding the words to help people transcend a tragedy or turn it into a triumph. We are healers. But we as a society are losing our vision of healing. As we search for control over our lives and over our health care system, we are beginning to move away from the notion of compassion. And I would argue that given a choice between competence and compassion, you should always choose competence, but you should never have to make that choice. Can the system accommodate it? I'm not sure. I don't have the answers. I have some ideas. I think we need to go back and define, are we looking for need or want? I think we have to identify how we are going to encompass our most vulnerable, the sick, the surviving, and the aging, the survivors of myriad childhood illnesses that have been cured, but at cost. And my generation, aging steadily, if not graciously, how are we going to maintain equity in the system? I don't know. One last story. A little boy that I started treating when he was two years old <coughs> recently turned 18, which is the age at which children move from the pediatric to the adult setting. And as he came for his last appointment, the nurse who was with me when I did the disclosure interview said to me, I never understood the impact of this disease until I heard you say to the parents of this child, your life will change irretrievably. As they came for their last appointment, the father wrote me a note. Thank you for the time which you have given us to be able to see our boy grow physically to young adulthood. Thank you from me as a father for the time to be able to carry my son on my shoulders to see his first baseball game. Thank you from me as a father for the time to be there when he asked about girls for the first time. But most importantly, thank you for the time to be able to see him mature into the kind of loving son that we as a family can be proud of. This child was cured. This family healed. Thank you.